Let's pray together. So, Father in heaven, we ask that you would speak to us now of your majestic love and authority. We want to know the risen Christ more. We want to enjoy him more. We want our lives to reflect his glory and to give him honor and praise. And so would you now meet us in these moments over your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, 21 years ago, in the spring of the year 2000, I was a freshman at Furman University, and I was being discipled by an older student who bent my arm to read the book Desiring God by John Piper. And in the weeks that followed, I was floored by the bigness and grandeur of God and the rightness of his pursuit of his own glory. And then wonder of wonders came my own satisfaction in him, which in turn glorified him. And so I came, became at that time what we call a Christian hedonist and also a Calvinist, even though there was some time for the, for the big pieces to settle into place. And one of those pieces that took some time for me was Jesus. How does he fit into this grand scheme of God's glory and the satisfaction of the human soul in the glorious God-centeredness of God and the satisfaction of my soul forever in his infinite worth and beauty? It took me some time to realize where Jesus fit in. How does the pursuit of God's glory and my joy in one pursuit relate to Jesus? Is he just the means to make it possible? Help for me came in early 2001. This little red hardback. It's paperback today. It was the end of my sophomore year. This is John's seeing and savoring Jesus Christ. I read it right when it came out, but I sped through it. I didn't read it devotionally. I didn't let it really change me. I came back to it a couple years later. I think I was a senior at the time and would read a chapter a day devotionally. There are 13 chapters, there's an introduction, makes for a nice two-week devotional, I would commend it, and I did the two-week devotional over and over again with daily readings, and it changed my life. I saw where Jesus fit. And the most transformative section of the book, for me, was chapter three, called The Lion and the Lamb. Let me read you the first two paragraphs of chapter three which are so significant for me. A lion is admirable for its ferocious strength and imperial appearance. A lamb is admirable for its meekness and servant-like provision of wool for our clothing. But even more admirable is a lion-like lamb and a lamb-like lion. What makes Christ glorious, as Jonathan Edwards observed over 250 years ago, is, quote, an admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies. I love that phrase. An admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies in Christ. Piper continues. For example, we admire Christ for his transcendence, but even more because the transcendence of his greatness is mixed with submission to God. We marvel at him because his uncompromising justice is tempered with mercy. His majesty is sweetened by meekness. In his equality with God, he has a deep reverence for God. Though he is worthy of all good, he was patient to suffer evil. His sovereign dominion over the world was clothed with the spirit of obedience and submission. He baffled the proud scribes with his wisdom, but was simple enough to be loved by children. He could still the storm with a word, but would not strike the Samaritans with lightning or take himself down from the cross. The glory of Christ is not a simple thing. It is a coming together in one person of extremely diverse qualities. End of quote. So I began to see that Jesus wasn't just the means. Jesus is the great end. He is the fullest 
and deepest revelation of God. To see him is to see the Father. Philip, don't you know that, Philip? John 14. And as Revelation 21 says, the glory of God will give light to the new creation and it has a singular lamp. Verse 23, the lamb. So in those days, it all seemed to come together for me in one text in particular, which is where I'd like for us to go today. That's Colossians 1, 15 to 20. I would not think of it as an exaggeration to say that this is one of the greatest paragraphs in the history of the world. It is dense with foundational and all-encompassing truth, and it is boldly Christ-centered. These may be the six most important consecutive verses in the Bible. See what you think about that, if you can find six consecutive ones that are more important. Here is the heart of what the Christian faith teaches about everything, undiluted, packed tightly into one short paragraph. Now, readers have long noticed that as we move from verses 9 to 12 into verses 13 and 14 and then into verses 15 to 20, there is a shift in Paul's language from his typically long flowing sentences to these short, simple, even poetic declarations about Christ. And because these six verses have that poetic feel to them, like a carefully crafted hymn or poem, some have speculated that Paul adopted it from early church worship and perhaps he adapted it for his purposes in Colossians. Maybe. I don't think that would be a problem if he did that. But I don't see any good reason to think it more likely that someone other than Paul needed to compose these sentences. The massive truth distilled here in such short space and in brilliantly simple sentences is a theological genius at work. And plainly Paul, along with guys like Luke and John, stands as one of the great theological giants of the first century. Why not Paul? Also, these six verses are manifestly tied to the rest of the letter. This is not an aside in the argument of Colossians. It is the very heart and core of Colossians. Indeed, we might even say Paul's theology. Among several observations we can make about these six verses, uh, the careful structure, the poetic elements, the word all or every, pos in the Greek, appears eight times in these six short verses. And so Doug Moo talks about this being the thread that holds the verses together. I think that's right. So let's look at Colossians 1, 15 to 20 and then highlight three truths about Christ, the God-man, as he's celebrated in this hymn. Verse 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So first, in verses 15 to 17, Jesus is the Lord of all creation. He's the Lord of all creation. We said that all is the thread that ties these verses together. So note just the the first five alls here in the first three verses. Jesus is firstborn of all creation. In him, All things were created. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. Now, what does it mean that Jesus is firstborn of all creation? 
To our ears, 2,000 years later, that may sound like he was born first or created first. But the word for at the beginning of verse 16 shows that's not what it means. Jesus was not born or created first because he was not created. All things that were created were created in him, which means he himself was not created. While this term firstborn does originate with the one who was born first, the firstborn son and the privileges of being firstborn son in the ancient world, the meaning it came to have in the, ultra, in the ancient world was much richer and deeper than merely being born first. Throughout the Bible, firstborn has a meaning of being most significant or beloved or prized or in the language of verse 18, preeminent. Verse 18 says, he's firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. However, Jesus being firstborn here, I don't think is totally cut loose from some time element, a kind of firstness, not just in preeminence, but in time. Or technically we might say before time. Verse 17 sums up verses 15 and 16 by saying he is before all things. Surely, as God, uncreated, always existing, begotten, not made, as the old creed says, Christ is before all things. But how's that in view here? How's that in view in verses 15 and 16? That brings us to how the poem starts in verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The word invisible here cues us in to what's at stake with this concept of the image of God. Jews and Christians alike often use this phrase, image of God. They use this image of God language because of its prominence in the creation account. Genesis 127, in the beginning God created in his image, man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. But do we often pause long enough and search out to find out what it means to be in the image of God? How might it help if we added the word invisible, like Paul does here? We are made in the image of the invisible God. I find that to be illuminating. Accenting God's invisibility points to the essence of what an image is, which is irreducibly visible. Invisibility is a property of created reality. God is uncreated, invisible. His world is created, visible. Visibility is created and derivative, not original. And Jesus here is said to be the visible image of the invisible God. So how does that work? What does it mean for Jesus to be Lord over all creation that all things are in him and through him and for him? In verse 15, not only is his eternal godness, deity in view, but also his incarnation, his humanity. The eternal, invisible son became visible by becoming man. That's what it means for Jesus to be the image of God. Image is connected to his becoming man. And that should be what gives us our bearings in discerning what it means to be in the image of God. Jesus is the image. And we are created in the image, which means that before God created the world, he planned what it would be like for he himself to enter in as a creature in the person of his son. Man is the creature designed by God for what his son would be and would be able to do when he came into his created world. 
Jesus as the God-man is the visible image of the invisible God. And in this sense, he is firstborn, preeminent, most important, most prized of all creation. Not firstborn in that he was first, he was the first man created, but firstborn in the sense that the first man, Adam, was created in the image of God. And Jesus is the image of God, as Paul says, not only here, but 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Humanity may have been created last on the sixth day, but God did all his creating from day one in view of setting up the world for man and not just man in general but his son as the ultimate man who would one day enter into the world as the firstborn. This world exists as it does and is what it is and has the history it does in view of God's son and through the agency of God's son working together with his father in creation and for his son, for his honor, glory, to accent his supreme worth and majesty. All creation is in Jesus and through Jesus and for Jesus, which means there is not anything in this world and not anything in your life that doesn't relate to Jesus. We often do not see how, but the problem is not with his being, but with our seeing. What then is the meaning of these pairs in verse 16, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, or the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. The answer is Jesus is truly Lord of all, even Lord over Satan and the demonic powers. If someone were to object to this exhaustive vision of the supremacy of Christ, one of the first things they might say is, what about the angels? What about the spirit world? Even better, what about Satan and the demonic powers? We might suspect that if there were any part of reality that was not in Jesus and through Jesus and for Jesus, it would be the spirits who have rebelled against God. But the answer is no, not even them. Whatever question you have, Whatever doubts you have about the utterly extensive sovereignty and omni-relevance of Christ, Paul's hymn says, yes, that too. He's sovereign over that too. He's supreme over that as well. Like R.C. Sproul was known to say, there, is no, there are no maverick molecules. Or as Abraham Kuyper said, and as we sang, there is not one square inch in all the universe over which the risen Christ does not say, mine. One last all then in verses 15 to 17. This is the end of verse 17. In him, all things hold together. This flows from what we've been saying about the supremacy and centrality and preeminence of Christ in all creation, but it's distinct and it's worth making clear. Not only was Jesus in view and the agent and the goal of all creation, but he also holds all things together. Not only is his involvement in creation exhaustive, but in every moment of every day, he doesn't make the watch and back away. He holds the world, all history, and our lives in his hands and keeps them ticking by the millisecond. And so we stand in awe of the utter lordship of Jesus Christ over all reality, even over Satan and the demons. Not only is he presently Lord, but in him and through him and for him was everything created and he holds it all together in every moment. And he is the image of God who came into the world. All reality is set up for the entrance of God himself into the creation, in the person of his son, and for his son to be the hero and the culmination and the heir of all things. So that's point number one. All the universe is calibrated for the coming of Christ. But now number two, what he achieves when he enters in. 
So number two, Jesus is the agent of all salvation. This is verses 18 and 20. He's Savior. He's means. The agent of all salvation. As impressive as it may be that Christ is Lord over all that exists in such utterly exhaustive and unrestricted terms, it is even more impressive that he is Lord over all the world to come. That's the progression of the poem. He is firstborn, preeminent, not only of the first creation, verse 15, but also of the ultimate creation, the new heavens and new earth, as head of the body called the church of the redeemed people for which the new world is designed. The first world was designed for his entrance and his work. And the new world is designed for his endless reign as supreme over all and head of this body called the church. As great a glory as it is for Christ to be the very image of God in whom and through whom and for whom all things exist, his role in relation to the church is even more significant. As Paul says in the companion letter to Colossians, Ephesians, we might call it, it is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, Ephesians 3.10. And the church is the people among which God's glory and praise reach their pinnacle, Ephesians 3.20-21. 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. That Jesus is head of his church means that he's leader and provider and protector of his church, even in pandemics. And that he has a body of people means that he is not alone in this new age that is coming and has already broken in. A people are with him. But how does that happen? The heart of the second part of the poem is that Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross. There is a massive assumption between part one and part two of the poem. Namely, sin. The horror of human history is that the creature made in God's own image rebelled against him. We made war on the very one we were supposed to live to display. We did the most irrational, pathetic evil we could when we distrusted the one who is infinitely worthy and we chose to go our own way toward destruction. And that is why we live in the world of war and chaos and conflict and disaster and disease that we do. So when the eternal Son of God finally took up our flesh and blood in the Father's plan, as God designed for him to do, and he entered into the world as the one in whom and through whom and for whom the world exists, his mission was to make peace between his people and himself. Not by killing the enemies of his father, but by giving up his own life to atone for his chosen people, even though they too had sinned against his infinite worth. In grace, he shed his own blood. And the meaning of the blood here is that he didn't die of natural causes. This was not a bloodless natural death. The blood means his life was violently, prematurely, and sacrificially ended in place of his people. So he's not only Lord of all creation, but he's also Savior, agent in all salvation. And then finally, number three, Jesus is the focus of all final satisfaction. In verses 19 and 20, two phrases in particular. And here's where we see how he's not just means, but end. And how the means accentuates the end. There's two phrases here in verses 19 to 20. The first is reconcile 
to himself. To reconcile means to remove the barrier and restore the relationship. The enjoyment of the person is the goal. When Jesus makes peace by the sacrifice of himself, he doesn't restore us to the creation as our final satisfaction. He reconciles us to himself, Paul says. Yes, to each other. That's part of that happens in the process. Yes, to the creation, that will happen. But ultimately to him. He's the focus. He's the source. The second phrase then, verse 19, is this phrase, all the fullness of God. Look at verse 19. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All the fullness of God, which has made God supremely and infinitely happy in the fellowship of the Trinity for all eternity. All the fullness is in Jesus. And through him, we taste the very fullness of God as our final satisfaction. All the fullness of God is in Jesus, not just for the sake of an effective redemption, but also for our eternal satisfaction in him. There is no delight, no goodness, no mercy in God that we must bypass Christ to get to. All the fullness, all the joy, all of God is there in him. And so Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3 that God's people would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God is in this man, Jesus. Full humanity and fullness of deity. We marvel at his bigness and his might and his omnirelevance and we melt at his grace and his mercy and his meekness that all comes together in one spectacular person. Fullness of God in this God-man whom we one day will see face to face and know more fully and enjoy without obstruction for all eternity. So let me finish with one more extended quote from chapter three of Seeing and Savoring. This glorious conjunction of diverse excellencies in Christ shines all the brighter because it corresponds perfectly with our personal weariness and our longing for greatness our personal weariness and our longing for greatness. The lamb-like gentleness and humility of this lion woos us in our weariness and we love him for it. But this quality of meekness alone would not be glorious. Mark that. The gentleness and humility of the lamb-like lion becomes brilliant alongside the limitless and everlasting authority of the lion-like lamb. Only this fits our longing for greatness. Yes, we are weak and weary and heavy laden, but there burns in every heart, at least from time to time, a dream that our lives will count for something great. The lion-like lamb calls us to take heart from his absolute authority over all reality. And he reminds us that. In all that authority, he will be with us to the end of the age. This is what we long for, a champion, an invincible leader. We mere mortals are not simple either. We are pitiful, yet we have mighty passions. We are weak, yet we dream of doing wonders. We are transient, but eternity is written on our hearts. The glory of Christ shines all the brighter because the conjunction of his diverse excellencies corresponds perfectly to our complexity. End of quote. So brothers and sisters, Jesus holds it all together. He is Lord of heaven and earth, of the first creation and the coming new creation, of the present and of the future, of all of history and of the smallest details of your life. He is a lion-like lamb and a lamb-like lion. 
He is Lord of all time and space, Savior of his chosen people, and the supreme treasure who corresponds perfectly with our personal weariness and our longing for greatness. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, we want to know your son in his admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies. We praise him as our Lord. We love him as our savior. We cherish him as the great treasure. And Father, we want the supremacy of Christ. We want this vision. We want this poet, poetic, struck, the poetic paragraph from the Apostle Paul here to mold and shape our lives. Make it true in our lives. Make it true in our studies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.